Any questions about the project or the project design? Um, we have essentially three topics to go over, if, if my memory is right. And then we have four weeks to do it in, I think. Let me think. This is week 11, right? So week 12, 13, 14, 15, right? We have four weeks and we have three topics. So, um, and, and in that mix, there could be time, there could very well be time for you to work on your projects in class, like instead of a lecture. And I'll let you know if that happens. A couple things to keep in mind. There will be no class next Thursday, all right? Um, so consider that a, a day to work on your, on your project. Um, I would like at some point for you to, uh, I know not all of you come to lab, but I would like at some point if you would, towards the end of the semester, um, show your lab to the other students in, in or show your project to the other students in, in lab. Um, that's good for a couple of reasons. That's good because sometimes they can point out things to you that you might have missed. Um, I know how it is even as a teacher, when you write instructions for something, you think you're being 100% clear, and then when other people read it, it's like, oh, I didn't know that you could take it that way. So that same idea applies, I think, when you're talking about a website and navigation and something that might seem obvious to you. You know, you get a little too close to the problem sometimes. It's possible. Uh, a, a developer can. And sometimes it's good to get sort of an outside perspective on it and they can let you know um, if things are as clear as you think they are in terms of navigation and, and, and other things. Um, so it's good for you to get some outside feedback. All right. Um, it's also good for the person that's viewing it because they can get some ideas of how to do some things. You know, gee, how did you make your navigation stay in the same place even when they scroll the page? You know, you can have a good exchange and you can learn things off of each other. So um, sometime before the end of the semester, like the last week or so, we might have a, a session where we are entirely in the lab and you can show what you're, what you're working on uh, to the other folks in class. The three topics that we're going to cover, we're going to cover forms, we're going to cover tables, and we're going to cover JavaScript. We cover JavaScript just to sort of complete the picture. Um, it, this class is not meant to make you an expert in, in JavaScript. There are other classes where we focus more heavily on JavaScript. But the idea is that JavaScript is, is such a fundamental part of web pages that um, it, wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be right for us not to talk about it at all. So we talk about JavaScript enough to give you uh, some idea of what it's used for on web pages and how to do a few simple things and to sort of get you interested in learning more about it. Tables are, eh, they're there. All right, not particularly exciting, I must confess. All right, forms are pretty fun now. Um, now, We've studied HTML for 11 weeks now. Not going to say we know everything about it, but we know quite a bit about it. And yet if you look at certain things, it's hard to imagine how you would even begin to write the HTML to do them. All right. In other words, there must be something else going on besides HTML. And a classic example of that would be if you did a Google search. You know, so you go to Google, and let's say we search for Italian restaurant. It thinks I am a machine. Yeah, probably because, yeah, that's weird. Now, notice something about the results, all right? 
I searched for Italian restaurants and notice where all the Italian restaurants are in the search results. The Olive Garden on West River Road, Angelina's Pizza on Abbey Road, Sereno's up on Detroit Road, Italian restaurants in Illyria, North Ridgeville, Illyria Olive Garden, Jojo Carloni's in Olmstead Falls. We must be very fortunate that all the best Italian restaurants in the world are in the Illyria, Ohio area. All right. Well, as much as I love this area, that's probably not the case, right? What is happening is, and, and, and if you could imagine, I have a brother that lives in New York City. I'm sure they have great Italian restaurants there. They have all kinds of great food there. But if he were to search for Italian restaurants using Google, he would get Italian restaurants in New York City. And someone in Chicago would get them in Chicago, and so on and so forth. It's very hard to imagine how you could do that with HTML. Right? We haven't learned anything in HTML that says, well, in this case, do this. In that case, do something else. All right? All the HTML that we have is simply very you know, simple, straightforward, this is the way my page is going to look like. And if you were to look at, if you were to email your page to someone in Los Angeles for your last lab, for example, and they were to open it up on their computer, it would look exactly the same for them as it did for you. All right? The kinds of web pages that don't change unless someone manually goes in and change the code are called static pages. Static in this context means unchanging. So if you were to open up your web page that you've turned in for lab one, it would look exactly as it did the day that you turned it in. And it's not going to change unless you manually go in and change the code and, and change it to do something else. All right? In fact, all of the pages that we've done this semester have been static pages. HTML is used to create static web pages. And at first, all web pages were static pages. Like when the web was first invented, that's, that's what they were. They were static pages. And you could do a lot with static pages. You know, for example, um, a restaurant that has a menu, you know, their menu doesn't change very often, right? Their hours probably don't change that often. Maybe once every couple years, they might change their hours a little bit. So you could create a website for a restaurant and make it a static website, and that would probably be okay. Because a restaurant doesn't change its information that often. All right? But something like Google, obviously something weird is going on here. Something, and by weird, I mean something beyond ordinary HTML. Because number one, I can search for literally anything I want to. So I can search for Asian restaurants. I can search for PHP. It's quite clear, and you can't see any of this, but take my word for it. PHP, I can search for Asian restaurants. I can search for Cleveland Browns.
Now, it's clear that they don't have a web page sitting out there for every single thing that you could possibly search for. That would be impossible, right? And it even gets worse, right? Because we found out that if I search for Italian restaurants, I get Italian restaurants near where I'm located at. So near Elyria, Ohio, whereas someone in New York would get them near New, near New York and so on. So they could not possibly have a static web page for everything you could possibly search for. So therefore, there's a different kind of web page. And these web pages are called dynamic web pages. Dynamic web pages are pages where the content changes without changing the code. And most of the main major websites that you would think about are dynamic pages, right? Google's an example of, of dynamic pages. In other words, there isn't someone changing the code for the search results because you've searched for Italian restaurants. And then they change it to something else if you search for Asian restaurants. There's code out there that gives you what you've searched for. Think of eBay. eBay, there's an item out there and people place bids on it. So if there was a, you know, if there was a, um, you know, a, a movie poster and someone bid $15 on it and someone came around and bid $20 on it. The next person that viewed it would see the bid of $20. And then if someone bid $25, then the next person that viewed it would see $25 and so on. There's not a programmer sitting at eBay headquarters, oh, someone bid $25 on that. Let me go and change the HTML for that. All right? That clearly wouldn't work, all right? Facebook. People update their Facebook status, and the next time you go and view your Facebook feed, you're liable to see that status. Um, Canvas. You go in and you log in to Canvas, you see the courses that you're enrolled in. I go in and log in to Canvas, I see the courses that I'm teaching. All right? So clearly, there's something else going on because the content of the page, the content of the Canvas homepage looks different for me than for you. And it's not that someone has written a separate HTML page for me and a separate HTML page for you. The pages that are viewed are called dynamic pages, which means that based on certain things, they change. Take a television network. If we were to go on to you know, HBO.com, is liable to show us what's playing right now, you know, what's playing Thursday morning. You know. If we went tonight, it would probably show us what's playing Thursday evening. If we went tomorrow in the afternoon, it would show us what's playing Friday afternoon, and so on. So there isn't someone manually changing that web page. The page is smart enough to know what day and what time it is, look up what's playing at that time, and display a web page. These are called dynamic pages. All right. An analogy I often give is like a static page is like if you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac. All right. You go to McDonald's like during the lunch hour rush, and there's a bin full of Big Macs, right? Just waiting for someone to come in and order them. So you go in and order a Big Mac. What does the server do? They take that Big Mac that's already been prepared, that's sitting out there waiting to be delivered and they give it to you, all right? So they make the Big Mac, it's sitting out there, and they deliver it to you. And your Big Mac's gonna look the same as my Big Mac, right? Because they all make them all, all to be the same. Now compare that with going to Subway. If I go into Subway, do they have a bin with all the possible sandwiches that you could order? No, because that would be much like Google having a different web page for every possible thing you could search for. You couldn't do it, you know. You couldn't have one Italian sandwich that's on white bread that's not toasted, one that's on Italian bread that is toasted, one with lettuce and onions, one with olives and spinach. 
there's too many combinations that they couldn't have prepared all of them in advance and have them sitting there waiting for you. So what do they do? You go in and you give them some information about what you want. I want an Italian sub. What do you want on it? Well, I want lettuce and tomatoes and mayonnaise. And then they go and they make it specially for you. Now here's an important thing to recognize. When you're done, both at Subway and McDonald's, they're giving you a sandwich. All right. Now that sandwich was made two different ways. One, it was made in advance and it was sitting there waiting for you. And in the other case, the sandwich is made right on the fly as you've come in and requested it. So that's sort of the difference be between static pages and dynamic pages. So let's see how that is accomplished. With static pages, writing your pages, you put them on a web server. One thing I would like to talk about if we have time is how to publish a website. That would be useful, at least give an overview of that. With static pages, you would put your HTML, CSS files, JPEGs, all the files that you have out on the web server. And when the client, the client being the person running the web browser, requested it, that request would go to the web server. The web server would grab those pages and deliver an HTML document that would contain HTML, CSS, etc. So this is like McDonald's. All right. These are static pages. The web server simply grabs a page that's already been finished and delivers it to the client that asked for them. Now, what you can't do with static pages is customize them. All right? You can't make it look different for each person because they're static. They don't change unless someone manually goes in and changes the code. So things like Canvas, things like Facebook, things like eBay, all those things are customized based on certain situations. So what do you have there in that case? In that case, you do not have completed web pages. These are called server-side scripts because they're scripts that live on the web server. What language are they written in? They're written in several different languages. There's a bunch of languages, actually. One of them might be PHP. One of them might be ASP.NET. Perl. Ruby. Python, etc. These are different languages that are written and run on different kinds of web servers. And their job is to create as output a web page. So when you go to Subway, right, and if you ordered an Italian sub, the server has a recipe in mind. The server knows what an Italian sub constitutes. You know, maybe there's salami and ham or whatever on it. All right? But the server gets from you some additional input. Like, for example, you know, what kind of dressing do you want? Do you want dressing? What kind of cheese do you want? What kind of bread do you want? What vegetables do you want? Do you want it toasted or not? So in server-side scripting, the client provides information that goes as part of the request, and the script takes that information, 
and creates a web page on the fly. Using that information, using the instructions that are in the script, and in many, many, many cases, interacting with a database. Now, some of you may have done stuff from data, with databases in other class. Maybe some of you have not. But a database is a place where you can store information. So, for example, let's think about Canvas for a second. I log into Canvas. What information do I provide? I provide my username and password. What does the script do? Well, the script checks the database to make sure that that user ID and password is valid. All right? Make sure that whatever user ID I put in is an authorized user. Make sure that the password that I entered in is a legal password. Assuming that it is legal, it will then look through the database and find all the courses that I'm currently teaching. And it will create a home page for me that shows all the courses that I'm currently teaching. Now if I didn't supply the right username and password, if I typed the password in wrong, it would supply me a message saying, hey look, you supplied the password wrong. All right. So the script would be smart enough to look up who I was, see if that credentials were valid. If it's valid, show me a list of, of um, courses that I'm, I'm teaching. If it's not valid, display an error message. A Google search. What information does the client provide? It provides the word that they want to search for, the terms that they want to search for. What does the server do? The server has instructions that looks through the Google database of all the web pages and pulls out the most relevant items on the search. Yes? Um, typically, uh, typically the dynamic pages um, there, there's a couple ways that you can make your page dynamic, and this deals with uh, the dynamic aspect of server-side pages. So server-side pages typically don't involve JavaScript. All right. Now you can also make your pages dynamic on the client side by doing things like having mouse over menus and things like that. And that, that would be more of using JavaScript. But yeah, JavaScript can come into play in making the page dynamic but not in this particular thing. Now, we notice with Google, for example, that it seemed to take more information than just, um, just uh, the term I searched for. In other words, it knew where I was, right? How does it know where I was? Well, it has my IP address. It can look at, at the IP address and get an approximate location. It knows what internet service provider it was assigned to and knows that I'm going through an Illyria, Ohio internet service provider. All right. So the information that the client provides, some of it is via forms, and some of it is other information, such as the IP address which can be used to determine an approximate location. The IP address doesn't give you like GPS location, like you can't pinpoint and say I'm sitting in BU 105, all right? But it can tell you, hey, uh, you're, you're in the Elyria, Ohio area. In addition, when you send a request to a web server, you let the web server know what platform you're on. Are you on Windows or a Mac? Are you on a mobile device or a desktop device? And so on. And all these things can be used by these languages to customize the web page it creates for you. Now, Here's a key point. Whether it be from static web pages or dynamic web pages, what gets delivered back to the client is the basic HTML that we've talked about all semester. So sometimes people, when I talk about dynamic 
web pages say, well, look, if you need all the, if you need PHP or ASP.NET, why do we even bother learning HTML if we're just going to go ahead and write PHP pages or ASP.NET pages? Well, because when you create a script, you are writing a little mini program that creates HTML. So if you're writing a program to create HTML, you better know what HTML looks like and how HTML works. All right, so even if you're going to spend most of your time writing server-side scripts, you need to know how HTML works because that's what your server-side scripts create, all right, is HTML. Um, it would be like, uh, you know, um, if you were writing a, a program in, in C Sharp to do, to calculate the area of a circle or calculate the area of a square or a rectangle or something like that. You would write instructions to do it, right? Well, you better know how to do it yourself before you try to write a program to do it, right? If I'm going to do a payroll calculation to calculate how much someone is paid and how much their withholding taxes are and all that, I better know how to do that myself before I try to write a program to do that, right? You can't write a program to do something if you don't know how to do it yourself, right? Well, it's sort of the same idea here. I can't write a program to create HTML if I don't know how HTML works myself. All right. So what does, that, what does all of this have to do with this class? We are focusing on creating HTML. We don't cover dynamic scripts in this class. Those are covered in CISS 232. CISS 243, and some in CISS 268. But we are interested in this class creating the forms in HTML to send the data to the server. That piece of it we study in this class because that is an HTML thing. All right? Because that's a chief way that users give input to the server is via a form. So I go to Canvas. What do I mean by a form? I mean fields that you can put information into. So for example, I go to Canvas to log on. This is a form. There's a text box, a text box, and a button. So I type in my credentials. Actually, this isn't a plain old text box, right? Because notice when I typed in, it doesn't show you what my password is. So that's actually a password field. And then this is a submit button. And this tells the browser to send a request to the server, to a server-side script, and send this information along with it. And then that, in, that information is used to first, the server's looking me up, making sure I'm valid, and then it's creating a page that contains the courses that I teach. All right. If I go to Amazon, and I want to create a new account. This is a form. Text box for name, text box for email, password, and password again. If I go to Google and search, we've already seen that. That's a form, these are submit buttons. We actually can go to advanced search and notice that there's different kinds of form items. These are plain old text boxes where you can put in just any word you want. These are drop down lists where you can select from a list of items.
and so on. So there's different kinds of form controls depending on the kind of data that you're entering in. Uh, and we'll review what those are. Um, you, you know, if you've been on the internet for a, any length of time at all, I'm sure you've seen all of them. And we'll, we'll just review what they are. So we have a little bit of a dilemma here. And here's our dilemma. Our dilemma is we want to study this part of it, the creation of the form, but we're not going to study this part of it. So how we're we going to do it. We're going to do it by using scripts that other people have written. For your lab assignment, you're going to use a script that I have written. And I do have to double check to make sure that that is on uh, LC's new um, CISS server. It's not? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 they, they converted to a new server, and that might be one thing that they, that they, that they lost in the shuffle. So I'll, 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 that shouldn't stop you from doing this. I'll, I just need to finish it up for you to completely test um, your page, all right? Um, and in my example in class, I'm going to use the Bing search engine. Um, why not? Well, I guess I could use Google's. Let's try using Google's. Actually, let's try Bing. I, I, I know when I've done this in classes before, I've had issues with. Okay. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a web page. So I'm going to create the form that will allow me to enter a search term in, and then I'm going to call Bing's search script to actually do the server-side processing. This, by the way, you know, is something that they allow you to do, so it's not as though I'm doing anything I shouldn't. And we're going to look at a, a simple example of a form. Buddy. I cannot type today. All right, there's a form tag, and if you're writing notes, give yourself some space. We're going to fill in that space with something in a minute. And there's an end form tag. A form is a collection of fields that you're going to send to the server as part of a request. So typically there's going to be more than one form field. All right. In this case, there's only going to be one. There's going to be the search term that we have. All right. But if we remember the Amazon one, there was actually four fields, right? There was a username, a password, an email address, and a confirm email address, something like that. If we looked at the advanced search, there was like maybe a dozen or so fields. The search term, the language that you were searching for, updated within the past certain amount of time, and so on. All right? All those things get sent sort of as one package. So think of the form tag as being like an envelope. And everything inside of that form tag is going to be put in the envelope that gets sent to the server. So typically, and again, I say typically, that doesn't mean all the time, but 
typically there's going to be one form tag, all right? Because you're going to send everything to the server in order for it to be processed. So if I go to log on, I, I need to send both my username and password to the server. I can't just send the username or can't just sort of send the password. If I'm doing an advanced search, I'm not just going to send the search term and the language. I also have to send when it was updated in the last period of time and all the other fields. So think of this as the envelope and everything that you're going to send to the server is going to be within that envelope. There is uh, an input tag. All right. And input type equals text. Um, simply means it's going to be a text box. A text box is for a single line of text. So one line. I also have a submit button. Now, if I go and save this, I'm going to have a form, and I'm going to have the visual part of the form, but the form isn't going to do anything. So I'm going to go up here and say File, Save, All Files, Form.html. I'm going to save it. And if I open it up, I have my text box and my submit button. All right. Text box I can put in, submit button I can press, and not much is going to happen right now, but we're going to make it so that something happens in a minute here. All right. So now we're going to go back in and we're going to fill in the missing pieces here. And to do that, I'm doing a little bit of reverse engineering. All right. There are two attributes that the form tag has. A method and an action. The method is one of two things, get or post. I swear I just saw someone look like they were riding a bicycle down the hall. And that just completely distracted me for a second. Because they would look like they were going this way, and then I'm like sitting here waiting for them to come out the other end, and they never did. So I'm really intrigued now. But I guess I'll continue, and maybe after class I'll, I'll look. At any rate, the method is either an action, uh, the method is either get or post. We'll go over this more in the future, in future classes. For now, we're going to always use get. And what does get mean? Get means that the data associated with the form is passed along with the URL on what is called the query string. So if we look at this, Notice that we have a URL, 
http colon www.bing.com search. Notice what is after that. Q equals PHP. Well, what was PHP? PHP is a thing that we searched for. So if I do a search for HTML5, Notice that Q equals HTML5. So Q, that's part of the query string, is what we have asked to search for. So the field we've asked to search for is identified by the name Q. All right? And it appears after the question mark. In a URL, everything after the question mark is called the query string. The query string are different parameters that you are passing to the server-side script. And they can come from the form or they can come from other places. In our case, it's coming from the form. All right? And with an action, I'm sorry, with a method of get, it shows the fields from the form as part of the query string. And that's what we're going to do most of the time, at least to start out. The other thing that we have is the action. And the action is the name of the script that we're going to call. And how do I know the name of the script I'm going to call? Well, this is the name of the script. Everything before the question mark is the name of the script that I'm calling. So, let's dissect this. I'm going to pass the data on the query string. So, my URL that I'm calling is going to be this, www.bing.com slash search. There's going to be a question mark, and then I'm going to pass all the data that is in my form. I'm going to call the data in this text box Q. So on the query string, it will say Q equals whatever value I have put in the text box. How do I know that? Well, because I've said get. Get means pass the data on the query string. So it's going to pass on the query string, and it's going to pass the value of whatever is in that text box. And why did I pick Q? Well, because that's the name that Bing is expecting. Bing, Bing is expecting the value that I'm searching for to be on the query string with the name of Q. So if I want to use their script, I have to provide the script the kind of data that it's expecting. So let's go and let's see if our little search page works. And let's take a closer look at the URL. So if I go and type PHP now, there we've done a search on PHP. Notice what our URL is. It doesn't look exactly the same as their URL, but it looks pretty much the same, at least the important parts. It looks similar enough where Bing knows what to do with it. Bing.com search slash search question mark Q equals and then the term that we've searched for. We search for HTML5. It does a search for HTML5. So, let's review the main parts of the form that we've talked about so far. Get simply means to pass the data on the query string. And that's what we're going to do for the first bunch of examples. We may do an example with the, with the other, other alternative, which is post. 
But when we're learning, I think it's better to use get because get actually shows you the data being passed on the query string. So I can look at the query string and see, yep, whoops. I can actually look at it and see, yeah, that got passed. Action is the name of the script that it's calling. And this is the name of the script that you call if you want to do a Bing search. Input type equals text is a text box. That's what the type equals text means. The name of Q, why is the name of Q? Because that's what Bing expected. I did a couple of sample Bing searches first, and I noticed on the query string the thing that I searched for had a name of Q. So if we look at the query string, after the question mark, you're going to see pairs of data. You're going to see the name of a field, an equal sign, and then the value. So the name of the field ought to be Q. And then the value is whatever value is in that text box. The submit button simply says, for any Star Trek Next Generation fans, it says make it so. All right. When you click on the button, that actually causes this script to get called and whatever other data, whatever data is part of the form, gets passed using these names as part of the query string because we've said get. All right. So, we're not going to write server-side scripts in this class, but we, know, we need to know how to hook to them. Now, for me to get this to work, I had to look at a couple Bing searches and do a, just a little bit of reverse engineering. It, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Keep in mind, if you were doing this as part of a project you were working on, you or someone in your team will have written both the client-side code that contains the form and the server-side code that processes the form. So let's say, let's say you and I were working on this together, and maybe you were writing the form in HTML and I was writing the PHP code. You would ask me, hey, what's the name of the script that this should call? What should it call each of the different things? What should it call the, the query string? And that's exactly what I provided in the pizza example. I provided the name of the script that you need to call, which again, I have to update because that's not correct quite yet. But I provided that, and I also provided um, what you need to call each thing uh, in, in the form. And if you call the thing correctly, then it will work. If you don't call the fields correctly, then, then you'll get an error. All right? Questions about any of this? So you're almost ready to write that lab assignment. One thing that's a little tough to do is I have to schedule the lab assignments, um, and sometimes it's not always clear. You know, sometimes I get a little behind or ahead on lectures. So we haven't completely covered everything we need to know to do this, but we've covered enough for you to at least get a start on the pizza lab. Do keep in mind that you know, if you're not comfortable starting that, you can always work on your project. So one nice thing about having a project do is that you should never be bored, all right? At least not until you finish the project. Next week, we will finish up everything you need with forms. What else do we need to cover? We need to cover the different kinds of form controls that you have, all right? Because text boxes are just one of them. We need to cover check boxes and radio buttons and drop downs and things along those lines, all right? And that's what we'll cover probably on Tuesday of next week. Any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.